I'm here with Pat Gallia, the communications lead for Icarus Interstellar. You know, you're the communications lead. What are the main challenges that you're facing in that position? Well, communications from a long distance is really, really hard. <laughs> That's uh, true, right? <laughs> it, it is really hard. I mean, you think it's hard from a deep space probe within the solar system. Uh -huh. Then you try and run the numbers on an interstellar probe and you realize just how far away the stars are. Um, in the Project Daedalus study that was performed in the 1970s by the British Interplanetary Society, they calculated how much power they would need to get a decent signal back from Barnard Star, which uh -huh. is about six light years away. And they realized they had to use a dish 40 meters in diameter with a 10 kilometer diameter array on Earth of radio dishes receiving the signal with a one megawatt transmitter on the Starship transmitting data back to Earth. Now, this gave them a signal which was less than a broadband link that you would have at home. So <laughs> it's, it's come a long way. <laughs> Exactly, and it, you know, this is not a lot of data, given that you sent a, a craft and it's taken 60 years to get to its destination. It, it's a really hard problem. Basically, the big problem uh -huh. is you've got to have a lot of power to get the signal back to Earth over such a long distance. And the other problems you have as well are that you have to keep the transmitter very carefully aligned with the receiver on Earth because it's so far away. The slightest deviation of the transmitter from the receiver and the signal's just not even pointing at Earth anymore. So th these are the really hard challenges we've got to, to overcome. And what are you guys doing to, you know, figure those out right now? Well, we're looking at uh, the kind of solutions that are being used in deep space probes at the moment. Uh -huh. um, but there are also studies that people are doing for various problems that they're trying to solve in terms of alignment for radio astronomy, for example, um, and other methods of navigation, such as looking at pulsars. These are natural beacons in the sky, which we can look at. And because we know exactly where they are, we can use them as signals, which can indicate where we are by looking at where those signals are relative to us. Is there one thing that you think is going to be particularly helpful in this project, technically? Uh, yes, I think laser technology particularly is going uh -huh. to be really helpful. In the old days, everyone was looking at radio technology. Uh, but these days, we've got a lot of advances in lasers. We can make them more powerful. We can get very high data rates out of them. And the big advantage of lasers is that they stay very, very narrow beam. So if you shine a laser from a long distance, it doesn't diverge as much as a radio beam does. If you can point it very accurately at your receiver, then it's a really good solution for getting a lot of data back from a long way away. Uh -huh. On the same technical realm, do you think there's a role for AI that can be built into Project Icarus as a vehicle? I think there's definitely a role for what we might call artificial intelligence. <laughs> the problem is it depends on what you define artificial intelligence to mean. In uh -huh. fact, How would you define that? Well, uh, there's artificial intelligence as people generally understand it, which is the sort of human-style artificial intelligence uh -huh. of a computer that can interact as if it were a human. Exactly. Uh, that's probably not what we would need on a starship. We need something that's very restricted in its focus. It knows how to maintain a starship. It knows what the mission goals are. It knows how to select targets, how to dispatch probes, how to repair systems on the starship. Mm -hmm. That kind of very restricted system, that's what I mean by artificial intelligence. And how likely do you think that is to happen? I think something that we would call artificial intelligence is very likely to happen. It wouldn't be something that people these days would probably accept as being an artificial intelligence in the sense that you get in science fiction films. Yeah. But it's the sort of thing, uh, in fact, I'll be giving a talk about it at this symposium, uh, machine learning technologies, the sort of thing you get uh, on web-based systems. Um, you get them on dating websites where it matches one person to another. Exactly. All this kind of technology that's used, uh, people are very familiar with this. In fact, they're so familiar with it, they don't really think of it as being artificial intelligence. And this is why we generally call these kind of things machine learning these days. Yeah. They're not as sophisticated as artificial intelligence, but they're doing something which is very clever underneath. And there's, there's so many areas where we can apply these techniques on the Starship. I think it's definitely something that's going to happen. There's a lot of research we need to do to make this work. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of things that are going on these days that can be used in something like that. Also, you're the current deputy project leader on this. You know, what is your role and how does it work given your design commitments on this? Yeah, it, it's not easy. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it's not.
Um, Andreas, of course, is the project leader at the uh -huh. moment, and so it's my role to support what he's doing. So where he, he doesn't have the time to, to do all the tasks that he needs to do as a project leader, I can fill in on those. Also, we have a structure on the project where we rotate the project, project leader job every year. So in a year's time, I'll be taking over as project leader. So in the meantime, I need to learn the ropes. So I need to look at what Andreas is doing and learn how to do what he does and maybe think about how that I... That can be a little tricky. Yeah, it is tricky. I mean, every project leader's got their own style. We've had Kelvin and Richard before, and they each had a completely different style from each other and different, again, to the, the style that Andreas has had. But, you know, we all have a different way of approaching these problems, and I'll learn from what Andreas is doing, and I'll apply my own uh, ideas yeah. on how I think it should be done. Uh, but, you know, different phases of the project have different needs as well, so you have to bear that in mind as well. Yeah. All right, so last but not least, how do other concepts like solar sails compare to things you guys are doing with Icarus or Daedalus? Uh, solar sails and other kinds of uh, propulsion technology are really interesting. Uh -huh. um, we're not married to the idea that the solution we're looking at must be the one that people eventually use. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a particular one. We had to choose a particular technology because otherwise we could have spent the five years of the project <laughs> just looking at propulsion technology uh -huh. and just trying to work out which one to use. So we've chosen fusion propulsion, um, but all the other ones are very interesting as well. And we'd like to see all the other ones also being developed by other teams so that we can have a fair assessment of all these different techniques. And at the end, we can look at them all and say, well, maybe not, we can't say immediately which one's the right one to use. But as time goes on and we can mature each of the technologies, we can decide which one will actually deliver the, the power capabilities that we need in order to reach the target within the time scales we've got. And what made you guys choose the fusion propulsion? Um, principally on Icarus, it's because we're descended from Project Daedalus in the 1970s, yeah. and that's the system that they used. And what so you we just want to stay true to form? Yeah, uh, we're basically using them as a baseline. Uh -huh. And so we're using uh, the Project Daedalus design and then perturbing that design. So we're, we're taking that as the, the system we're starting from. And as we work out new calculations, we change their design piece by piece until we come up with a final design, which is what Icarus will be. Now, we don't know yet how far Icarus will be different from the original Daedalus design. I feel like it's going to be really different. I, I suspect Maybe? it will be. I suspect okay. it will be a very different design. We're already talking about some geometries that, that will look very different. I mean, the, the shape of, uh, of Daedalus uh, had a particular iconic shape, which everyone's familiar uh -huh. with now. But Icarus could well be a long needle shape, um, yeah. or it could be a squat shape. Who knows? We don't have to stick with what Daedalus did. And it'll be really interesting to see what we end up with. I'm very excited. I know everyone else is out there, too. But thank you so much for all your time you. today. And this has been super helpful, just you know, so we all know what's going on with Project Icarus. But thank you so thank much. You.